people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Al-Qaeda terrorist Omar Said's release exposes Pakistan's failure to act against terrorists. Taliban attack surge in Afghanistan's Kabul says US watchdog. An explosion near Israel Embassy in New Delhi attempts to disrupt peace. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, where the killer of US journalist Daniel Pearl is all set to walk free. This comes after Pakistan's Supreme Court ordered the immediate release of British-born Al-Qaeda terrorist Ahmad Omar Sai Sheikh. The Apex Court's order on Omar Sheikh underlines that terrorists in Pakistan not only enjoys government's patronage, but judiciaries as well. Daniel Paul's life ended in the most violent way at the hands of terrorists who filmed the journalist's beheading and sent a video to the U.S. consulate in Pakistan. Three of the brutal criminals responsible for the incident were sentenced to life in prison and the main culprit Ahmad Umar Shahid Sheikh was sentenced to death. But almost 20 years on, the story is far from done. A panel of three judges of Pakistan's Supreme Court recently ordered the release of Saeed Sheikh. Last year, the Sindh High Court had commuted the death penalty of the British-born Sheikh to a life sentence and acquitted his three co-accused of murder while only convicting them for kidnapping, citing lack of evidence. The government and Paul's parents challenged that decision and pleaded to the Supreme Court to reinstate the death penalty. But the apex court struck down both the pleas in a split decision. The court also directed authorities to shift Umar to a government rest house. Washington has expressed shock and anger over the judgment and urged Islamabad to review its legal options to ensure justice is served. The United States is outraged by the Pakistani Supreme Court's decision to affirm the acquittals of those responsible for Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl's kidnapping and brutal murder, which shocked the world's conscience in 2002. This decision to exonerate and release Sheikh and the other suspects is an affront to terrorism victims everywhere, including in Pakistan. We recognize uh, uh, past Pakistani actions to try to hold Mr. Pearl's murders, uh, murderers accountable. And we do note that as of right now, Omar Sheikh remains in detention in Pakistan under national security authorities. But we call on the Pakistani government to expeditiously review its legal options, including allowing the United States to prosecute Sheikh for the brutal murder of an American citizen and journalist. Regretfully, this is not an isolated case but a general pattern observed in most of the cases in Pakistan. The existing criminal justice system in Pakistan has failed to prevent and prosecute crime, as the system is perpetuating miscarriages of justice and appears to be on the brink of collapse. The decision by the Supreme Court to free the men in the murder of Daniel Pearl is a complete failure to attain the ends of justice. It is a defining case for the Pakistani state and its judicial system involving freedom of the press, the sanctity of every life, freedom from terror, and the manifestation of a welcoming and safe Pakistan to the world. For India, it is a travesty of justice, but not a surprise. I had mentioned earlier about the very low conviction rate in Pakistan when it comes to sentencing of terror accused. And this case truly demonstrates the lack of any seriousness on the part of Pakistan on taking action on terror-related issues. It is also a travesty of justice not to find Omar Saeed guilty of any charges in this heinous act of terror. Our position 
on Pakistan taking sustained, verifiable, credible and irreversible action against terrorism and terrorist funding emanating from all territory under its control remains unchanged. The brutality of Paul's killing had shocked many in 2002, years before the Islamic State group regularly began releasing videos of beheadings. For Pakistani judicial system, this brutal criminal who played a crucial role in organizing the abduction and detention of Daniel before ordering his captors to kill him is just a scapegoat. So as per Pakistani pro-criminal judicial system, a scapegoat was swapped for 170 passengers of hijack IC-814. These kind of terrorists are set free because they are Pakistan army's assets. They are creations of Pakistan army. Sheikh Umar, a British national who committed so many terrorist activities in Pakistan and notably he killed Wall Street General, uh, journalist Daniel Pearl. Daniel Pearl was kidnapped by him. There are so many videos. He uh, killed him on record and still he is set free. So this happens only in a banana republic where in an stratocracy where army decides everything. So this is the state of Pakistan's army's terrorist activities and their assets. Pakistan's criminal justice system has long been blamed for failing to deliver justice and this verdict is an indictment of mockery that exists in the country in the name of the judicial system. Now this case seems certain to test the new US administration's ability in dealing with Pakistan, considered a key ally in getting peace in neighboring Afghanistan. While the intra-Afghan peace talks are advancing at a slower pace, the war to nation is witnessing a rapid surge in violence. With the daily attacks on security forces, Taliban is now using a new scare tactic of targeting the prominent civilians in the country. Recently, a report by a US watchdog also highlighted the fact that Taliban attacks in the Afghan capital of Kabul are on rise with increasing targeted killings of government officials, civil society leaders and journalists. Have a look. For several years, the Taliban suicide bombers frequently struck high-profile political and security targets in Afghanistan's key cities. However, in a major change of strategy, the Taliban is now targeting civilians like government workers, journalists, human rights activists, religious leaders and women in major public roles. A recent report by a US watchdog also emphasized the rise in targeted killings of several civilians in the country. It comes as the Biden administration plans to take a new look at the peace agreement between the US and the Taliban signed last February under former President Donald Trump. The Biden administration believes it is hard to see a way forward for a negotiated settlement with the Taliban unless the militant group meets its commitments under a 2020 deal. I said yeah. the Taliban are not meeting their commitments to reduce violence and to renounce their ties uh, to al-Qaeda. They are not meeting their commitments. And as long as they're not meeting their commitments, it's going to be difficult for anybody at that negotiating table to meet their commitments. In fact, it wouldn't be the wise course. I mean, we, we obviously are still committed to ending this war, but we want to do it in a responsible way. Um, and I don't think it's helpful to be drawn now into specific hypothetical discussions about the troop numbers on a, on a, a you know, specific calendar basis. We're still committed to ending this war. And we obviously, the president has made it clear he wants to bring uh, American troops home from Afghanistan. But we're going to do it in lockstep with the diplomatic process to try to find a negotiated settlement. I'm not trying to recast that. After more than a year of negotiations, previous U.S. government and the Taliban signed a peace deal on February 29, 2020. In return, Taliban gave three guarantees, reduction in violence leading to a ceasefire, cutting ties to transnational terror groups like Al-Qaeda and negotiating with the Afghan government. However, the insurgent group have flouted all three fundamental conditions that they had agreed upon 
for the withdrawal of U.S. forces by May 2021. The report by U.S. watchdog has highlighted that the number of attacks in Afghanistan by the Taliban in the last quarter of 2020 were higher than the same period the year before. Thus, there are apprehensions that international troops are likely to stay in Afghanistan beyond the deadline. However, Taliban is adamant at their stance of not bringing down the level of bloodshed until the U.S. forces exit completely. Afghanistan <laughs> Taliban insurgents use U.S. military operations in Afghanistan as a justification to their non-stop campaign of violence. To questions related to spike in violence in Afghanistan and violation of the Taliban-Washington agreement, the Taliban representatives accuse the U.S. forces of launching new attacks and trying to capture Taliban areas. There is no easy way out of Afghanistan conflict. If the US and NATO decide to keep their troops in Afghanistan beyond the May deadline, it could result in an abandonment of the agreement and a renewed conflict with the Taliban. If the U.S. withdraws before significant progress has been made in intra-Afghan talks, there is a risk that the whole procedure could collapse and result in civil war, destabilizing the region and reviving the Al-Qaeda threat. Observers say that the new U.S. administration should carry out an honest review of the entire peace process and push the Taliban to make concessions. The talks are crucial to find a lasting solution to the Afghan conflict. But it should not be on the Taliban's terms, which could wipe away whatever little progress Afghanistan has made in the last several years. Let's now move to New Delhi, where recently a low-intensity blast took place near the Israel embassy. It coincided with the anniversary of India and Israel establishing full diplomatic relations on January 29, 1992. The blast claimed to be carried out by an unknown terror outfit seems to be an attempt to dent India's diplomatic relations with Israel. A blast caused by a very low intensity improvised device near the Israeli embassy in New Delhi shattered the windscreens of three cars in the area. Fortunately, no one was injured in the incident. Although an unknown and unheard organization named Jeshul Hind claimed responsibility for the blast, the National Investigation Agency is currently probing the claim made on Telegram. Sir, as we have collected, we have all the handover of the brothers. एक्सप्लोशन था अब क्या एक्सप्लोशन था ये लेबोरेटरी में एग्जामिनेशन के बाद केमिकल एग्जामिनेशन के बाद ही हम लोग बताने बता पाएंगे मोर ओवर अ लेटर फाउंड क्लोज टू द सीन ऑफ अ ब्लास्ट वाज अ डेथ थ्रेट टू द इजरायली एंबेसडर दैट वॉन्ड ही वाज कांस्टेंटली बीइंग वॉच्ड 
and could be attacked at any time. The handwritten note in English was addressed to the ambassador Ron Malka and referred to him as a terrorist of the terrorist nation. The explosion took place on a day the two countries marked the 29th anniversary of the establishment of their diplomatic relations. This explosion is also being seen as an attempt to dent India-Israel ties. All the options are there uh, on the table. What uh, we can see and I should mention is that uh, yesterday, uh, when this uh, uh, evil attack was conducted, we celebrated uh, the 29th anniversary for the full establishment of uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and India, exactly yesterday. 29 years of thriving and growing relations between Israel and India, we just celebrated yesterday, so it might not be a coincidence, but uh, again, all the options are investigated. This isn't the first time that India-Israel diplomatic ties were tested. In February 2012, a bomb attack on an Israeli diplomatic car in the national capital left four people injured. There are some countries and some non-state organizations that don't really like what is happening between Israel and India, which can be a shining example for the world, how two countries can collaborate and work together. Since the two countries formally established diplomatic relations years ago, New Delhi and Tel Aviv have cemented the understanding that as democracies and victims of terror, both sides would collectively fight this menace. After this incident, security has been raised up for Israeli tourists in India. After Delhi ke incident, ke baad, uh, par bhi Maklodgan, Dharamkot, ke mein, jahan par, uh, hai, par the Israeli population is वहाँ पर पेट्रोलिंग इंटेंसिफाई कर दी गई है दिन में भी रात में भी और पुलिस स्टेशन में क्लोडगंज हैज बीन पुट ऑन अलर्ट टू कोप विद एनी सिचुएशन इफ इट अराइजेस इजराइल विद इट्स एक्सटेंसिव नॉलेज ऑफ इस्लामिक टेरर ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस देयर फंडिंग ट्रेनिंग एंड ओवरऑल मोडस ऑफ रैंडी रिमेंस द फॉर्मिडेबल पार्टनर ऑफ इंडिया बट दिस इज एग्जैक्टली व्हाट सम नेशंस एंड फोर्सेस आर नॉट कंफर्टेबल विद आफ्टर दिस डेटोनेशन India promised the fullest protection for Israel's mission and diplomats and pledged to spare no effort to trace the perpetrators and Israel has also shown full trust in Indian authorities. Well, the Minister of External Affairs, uh, Dr. Jashenko, called our Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Foreign Secretary called our DG in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The NSA called our NSA, so there is a full collaboration. They, of course, gave their assurances uh, and offered all the support and the protection that we need and if there's any assistance that we need. And of course, uh, said as uh, usually we say between friends, they will do whatever is needed and we have full trust in the Indian authorities that uh, it will take any measures that are needed first to protect uh, the Israeli representatives that are here in India and uh, second uh, to conclude uh, this investigation and finding those that are responsible for that. Any attempt to disrupt the growing strategic partnership between New Delhi and Jerusalem will go in vain. Whoever feels threatened by the expanding and flourishing relations between India and Israel will not get its target because both the countries are going to expand it further and will prosper together. Pakistan has been relentless in its efforts to foment terrorism in Kashmir by exporting trained terrorists into the valley to execute dreaded terror attacks against Indian security forces and innocent Kashmiri civilians. Thousands of people have been killed by Pakistani terrorists in the Kashmir Valley. However, it is now pretending to be a peace-loving country. In a marked shift, Islamabad recently made a move to tone down its rhetoric against India. But India, which is well aware of Pakistan's unwarranted terror policy, continues to bust all its lies and propaganda, a report. Ever since the India-Pakistan partition of 1947, Jammu and Kashmir has remained at the target of Pakistan's state-sponsored terrorism. Be it deadly terror attacks, cross-border firing or passing baseless comments on Kashmir, Islamabad has not deferred itself from indulging into anti-Indian activities. However, in a very surprising move, Pakistan is now trying to project itself as an ideal of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. 
Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa recently said that Pakistan and India must resolve the long-standing issue of Jammu and Kashmir in a dignified and peaceful manner, as per the aspirations of people of Jammu and Kashmir, and bring this human tragedy to its logical conclusion. Though, just a day after giving this remark, Pakistan Army killed an Indian soldier while firing along the line of control in Jammu Kashmir's Rajouri district. Giving a befitting reply to Pakistan's duplicity, India snubbed its proposal that for any resumption of talks to resolve the issue of Kashmir can only take place if Pakistan shuns use of terrorism as an instrument of state policy. Our position on this is well known. India desires normal neighborly relations with Pakistan in an environment free of terror, hostility and violence. The onus is on Pakistan to create such an environment. Pakistan, which has lost its credibility in the global arena due to its constant support of terrorism, is somehow trying to convince the international community that it is a country that is working towards peace. However, in reality, it continues to be a monster. It is using all the tricks in its book to incite terrorism in India and in particular in Jammu and Kashmir. Recently, two terrorists belonging to Pakistan-backed Jesh e Mohammed terror outfit were arrested along with arms and ammunition in the Union territory. They were indoctrinating youths and influencing them with false narratives and enticing them to take violent parts besides providing them arms, ammunition and other resources for spreading violence. We have a Abdul Mazid Khan, who is a ex-militant who has been an ex-militant and was also an ex-militant contractor. We have done a zero in. हमें उसके बारे में पता चला तो उसको ट्रैप किया गया और जैसे उसको ट्रैप किया उससे हमें तीन ग्रेनेड और एक पिस्टल जो है रिकवर हुआ उसके साथ उसका एम्युनिशन भी रिकवर हुआ और जब उससे फर्दर हमने पूछताछ की उस पूछताछ के दौरान पता चला कि ये जैशे मोहम्मद का ओजीडब्ल्यू है At a time when the countries are making an integrated approach to defeat the menace of COVID-19, Pakistan is still focused on its strategies to spread terrorism across the globe. Pakistani army generals, who are the real masterminds behind most of the terrorism across the globe, believe that the world won't notice their devious plans. But to their surprise, not only all of their diabolic activities are being monitored, but being given a befitting reply by the Indian forces. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.